Um, so announcements. So as far as I know, and um, talk to my pen, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I believe that says the polls back online. Can everyone submit? They're good. Good. Um, so apologize. There was an ITS issue. Um, and we have basically get the operator off of the morning. So a little bit of a short. Sorry that we were not. Um, I do want to make one announcement because I do regularly teach this class and we use it as a poll. I know that we were down for a little bit. Do please be kind to the auto grader. Um, please use the auto grader to check your submissions and everything, but also do not use it as like a code indentation tool. Um, it will go down if that happens. So um, just, just be kind, especially while I'm here. Um, does anyone know where this meme is from? Has no one? Oh my God. Okay, Jerry McGuire almost required more. So, um, just um, in case it hasn't been said yet in the course, um, the auditor is a very delicate thing. So, um, again, we want you guys to use it and we want you guys uh, to make sure that um, you are able to submit to it. We apologize for the job, but don't get too excited that you crush it. Um, this issue was not caused by you guys at all. It was an ICS issue. Um, but it can go down if we got too many submissions. So, any questions? Awesome. So, uh, back to the scheduled program. So, we are going to uh, revisit and train the satisfaction problem. And today, what I'll be doing is I will be going back to the topics that we talked about last time. I'm going to give a little bit of a review. And then um, we're going to go on to new topics today. Um, and you guys are going to have a little bit of time to practice some of the things that we learned today. So we are thinking about a standard search formulation, okay? So we can use a standard search formulation of CSPs, and it's going to be incremental. Uh, what we started with last time is we really started with the most straightforward and, and dumb approach, and now we're working on fixing it. Remember, we started with a really simple CSP of two bits. We showed that there was a lot of redundancy. And so now what we're going to be doing today is we are going to make that better. In general, when we think about CSPs in terms of a standard search formulation, the state will be defined by the values assigned so far. We'll use an initial state, which just starts as the empty assignment. Then we'll have a successor function that assigns a value to an unassigned variable. And then we will have a goal test. The goal test will be whether the current assignment is complete and satisfies all the constraints. Okay. So, um, we started with this, or we sort of ended with this last time when we started talking about the two really meaningful questions that we need to think about when we're studying CSPs. Okay, the first question is which variable should be assigned a value next? Right, we have to come up with some sort of ordering. Okay, and that's going to depend on a lot of factors. And what we're going to be doing today is we are going to be figuring out the right heuristics for. Which variable should be assigned and in which order should its domain be sorted? Okay. And in particular, what we're thinking about are what are the implications of a partial assignment for yet unassigned variables? And this is what's leading us to constraint propagation. Okay. And we sort of ended the, the lecture last time thinking about constraint propagation for the map coloring example. And that's where we're going to start off today. Okay. Any questions on this? This is kind of a roadmap for what you're going to be doing. Great. So um, we talked about this a little bit last time. I'm just going to give a, a little bit of a review and then we'll start going through this. So again, remember the map coloring problem. We are using this problem, especially for Australia, because it's pretty simple. Um, and there's also some out, uh, you know, a little island here, Tasmania, so it makes it pretty easy to think about. Um, so what we're going to be doing, and we saw this last time, is I'm going to give you a partial assignment, okay? In a lot of the problems that you see, you may or may not be given a partial assignment. So you may have some variables that are already set value. You might start with a blank slate, but for demonstration purposes, we will sometimes start um, from a partial assignment, just so we can sort of show what's the most appropriate things for us to assign next. Okay. So what we started with was this assignment. And most people responded last time that they thought the next variable we should look at is SA. Right. And 
There are several reasons why we might want to choose SA next. Okay, and the way that that is basically formalized is what is called the minimum remaining values or most constrained variable heuristic. It's also called fail first. And so what this means is that we take the variable with the fewest remaining values. So what does that look like? If we go back to the map here, uh, sorry, so if we go back to the map here, the variable that has the least amount of values that it can be colored is SA. Why is that? Well, because it's already bordered by two parts here that are already colored, two territories. And in fact, the only color it can be is blue, right? It's the most constrained variable. So that is sort of our first idea for thinking about the most constrained variable heuristic or the one that has the least remaining values. Connecting this back to what we did last time, was this an idea that people used in Sudoku? How many people use this kind of property in Sudoku, right? A lot of people, when they're doing these types of problems, whether it's Sudoku or I don't know, how many people still play Wordle? Anybody? Okay, I'm too old, fine. Um, so a lot of people actually, we use this heuristic naturally. So um, a lot of the questions to rely on this, just remember, MRV, minimum remaining value is the most constrained variable. Okay, where we pick the variable with the fewest remaining values. Okay. Now, again, we were starting with this one first um, for another example of the choice of variable, where if you were basically starting from zero, okay, which one would you pick and which one would you color first? So one possible choice for this is SA, right? And again, this is sort of where we left that off structure. Why, if we were given a blank slate, would we want to start with South Australia or SA? Um, the reason is a couple different factors, right? The one thing is that if we look at SA, its color affects the most of its neighbors, right? It's the most well-connected variable here. If our constraints are that none of the neighboring continents or territories are going to be the same color, the obvious answer is SA. Now, some other people may come back and say, oh, well, maybe I want to color Tasmania first. There are other heuristics for that, but if we're thinking about the choice of variable, one other thing we might want to think about is what is called a degree heuristic. So first we talked about the most constrained variable. Now we're talking about this idea of a degree heuristic. This is where you select the variable that is involved in the largest number of constraints on other unassigned variables. Okay, why is it called degree heuristic? Because, again, it's a variable that is connected to the highest degree. It's connected to the largest amount of constraints on other unassigned variables. Okay. Any questions on this? I know that these are very simple examples, but we'll, we'll get to some more complicated ones a little bit later. Okay. So, so far we've talked about our choice of variable, okay? Um, but there are several different ways that we want to think about solving constraint satisfaction problems. We haven't talked at all about how we think about the ordering of the values. And that's what we're going to be talking about next, okay? So um, if, you know, we were sort of going through the last example here. Now, if, uh, let me go back once. So if we decided, we're going to color Q next, right? A really bad idea would be to color it blue, right? Why would that be a bad idea? Well, the reason that would be a bad idea is because that doesn't leave us with any choices here for South Australia, right? We're not, you know, in this uh, ordering, we're not following any of the variable heuristics and just sort of, again, showing this as a partial ordering that we've given, which is a partial assignment. And we've just decided that we're going to color Q next. In fact, what we would want to do is we would want to color Q red, right? Why would we want to color it red? Because then that lets us color SA blue. Remember, no neighboring territory can have the same color. And again, there's a way that we can formalize that. Okay, that is what is called the least constraining value heuristic. Okay, so 
the idea here is that we would prefer the value that leaves the largest subset of legal values for other unassigned variables, okay? This is sometimes called LCV, least constraining value. Um, so, you know, we really want to find and use these heuristics because again, if we were to make a mistake and color this blue and we weren't sort of checking the things next to us, then we would get into this um, really terrible situation. So again, these constraining value heuristics, we would prefer or we basically prioritize the values that leave the largest of them of legal values for other unsigned variables. Why? Because that makes us e it makes it easier for us to sort of choose, and then we don't have to backtrack and do different things. Okay. If we combine this heuristic, so if we say, okay, we are going to choose values according to the least constraining value heuristic, and we use the minimum um, remaining value or most constrained variable heuristic, then we can solve n means for n approximately equal to one thousand. So this is pretty good, right? We just added a couple different heuristics and all of a sudden we do a lot better. Are there any questions about this? Okay. So now we are going to talk about something that's called constraint property. Okay, so now we are basically going to be talking about the um, the way that we are going to propagate constraints to our system. I'm going to sort of show it like this and introduce this, and then we'll we'll get back to the different types of constraint propagation algorithms. Okay, so I just want you guys to sort of get an idea of what this looks like. Okay, so we're going to start with all of our variables, right? Our variables are the different territories listed up here. And then we are going to list the possible values that they can be here. And there are several different ways that we can basically copy and constraint to our system. One thing that we might do is we might assign one of the variables. Okay, so for example, if we were to assign West Australia to be red, then we would cross out red for North Territory as well as for South Australia because they're neighbors. Okay, and we're going to go through a few different ways to, to do that. Now, again, this is, looks really simple, and we're going to talk about ways that we can do algorithms to do uh, different types of constraint propagation. Okay, for CSPs, this is a really useful way to sort of keep track, and I think on your worksheets, you also have similar tables. So I just wanted to get you guys used to this sort of notation. Any questions here? We will go back to solving it with different algorithms later in the lecture. Great. So let's go through our backtracking algorithm one more time. So we've seen this before, but there is a algorithm, if we will call it CSP or constraint satisfaction backtracking, backtracking. It initially takes an empty set. But when it's not on the empty set, we give it a partial assignment of variables. Okay, that partial assignment is denoted by A. If A is complete, then we're going to return it. Otherwise, we are going to select some unassigned variable, which we might do with some heuristic. Right? We've seen a couple. And then we are going to select an ordering for the domain of that unassigned variable. Okay. If you have this in an ordering, then you're going to go to the order here. If it's consistent with A, then you're going to add it to our set. And then you're going to recursively call CSV backtracking. Otherwise, if it results in a failure, then you just return the result. And if you go through and don't make an assignment, then you return failure. Okay. So we're, I'm just sort of showing this algorithm again, just so you guys get a feeling for what this looks like. Okay. But again, what we really want to do is we want to have the ability to sort of propagate these constraints through the system. And that's the idea of using constraint propagation. Okay. Constraint propagation is the process of determining how the values of one variable affect the possible values of other variables, right? This is just basically checking things. And what we want to do is we want to sort of see a little bit more into the future, right? We want to have a little bit more of a horizon. And that's what we're going to be doing with what's called constraint propagation. 
One way to do constraint propagation is what's called forward checking. Um, I'm pretty sure when a lot of you guys were playing Sudoku, a lot of what you were doing was forward checking. Okay, so what is that process? That means after a variable X is assigned, okay, so after we give X a value of B, so we've assigned X to value B, then we are going to look at everything that's connected to X, right? Just like we saw in the example before. So we will look at each unassigned variable Y that's connected to X by some constraint, and we're going to delete it from Y's domain so that any value that's inconsistent with V is basically removed from the equation. Okay. Now I'm going to show that with the example that we saw before, right? The map coloring example. Okay. So um, I'm going to do this. I'm assuming, you know, I set my ordering. It doesn't necessarily follow the heuristics that we were looking at, and that's purely for sake of example. So if it doesn't turn out optimally. Uh, that's basically why. Um, so again, I'm purposely doing this without heuristics, just so we can demonstrate forward checking. Again, I think this is very similar to what you guys were doing in Sudoku. So first thing that we do, and this is the notation that we show in forward checking, um, you'll see this on your worksheet, is we are basically going to say um, the round that it's assigned, so this is the first round, and we're going to give it a value of R. Okay, so if we color West Australia red by forward checking, we basically need to cancel out red from the domain of all its neighbors. Okay, so we do that for no territory which is connected by an edge. Um, and then we also do it uh, for South Carolina, uh, South Australia as well as Okay, I know this is very simple, but good to see. So let's say in the second round, we assign Queensland here to green. Okay. Right. And we carry over the eliminations that we had from the last round. And then we add that North Territory and South Australia also cannot have green. Okay. Similarly, we also have that New South Wales cannot be green. Okay. And we can continue going with this process. Right. So let's say that we color. Uh, I think it's Victoria blue, then we basically are going to cancel out all the blues in the domain. But what happens here? Uh, basically, what happens is, is now we get to an assignment, okay, where we don't have a color for South Australia, right? One of the problems here is that with forward checking, we can lead to an impossible assignment, okay, that forward uh, checking does not detect. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about now is how we uh, add an additional look ahead so we don't get stuck in these types of situations. Okay, any questions on this? Yes. Hmm? Yeah, so this is basically a way to sort of check your forward, uh, basically check your, um, your next decisions. You can use this in addition to backtracking, um, but some people will also use this uh, just standalone. Again, it depends on the type of problem space that you're seeing, right? If you have a really small uh, value set for your variables, this could be a lot more efficient. It just really depends on the type of problem. We're going to show several techniques, and then we'll show one that's better than all the rest. Great. So. Essentially, what we want to do is we want to have something that looks like this, right? So we want to have a way that we can solve a constraint satisfaction with a combination of heuristics and forward checking. And actually, if we incorporate both of them, so if we use heuristics along with forward checking, then we are going to find a out, an algorithm and assignment that is more efficient than using either approach alone, okay? And it's just adding a few small things. Forward checking will uh, propagate the information from the unassigned, the assigned to the unassigned variables, but it does not provide detection for all failures. Okay. Um, one type of advanced constraint propagation method repeatedly enforces constraints locally. Okay. Um, 
So just like we saw with search and heuristics, you know, we found some things, they're pretty good, right? But they're not perfect. And so what I'm gonna show next is uh, another algorithm that um, actually does much better. And this is what's called art consistency. Have people seen art consistency before? Okay, so art consistency is a very interesting idea. It's a very interesting algorithm. And I find that for a lot of students, this can be pretty confusing. So we're going to go through this very slowly. We will see some algorithms and then we will come back to it. Okay, so art consistency is a directional check. Okay, notice here on the slide, I have an arrow from X to Y. It is, again, this is directional. X to Y, so the arc that I draw from S to Y, so you see a directional arrow here between South Australia and New South Wales. So this is consistent, if and only if, for every value of X, so for every value here, there is some allowed Y. It's not checking the other direction. It's just saying that for every value of X, then there is some allowed Y, okay? So if I to do it for this example, so if I look at South Australia, right? We say that there's our consistency, South Australia to New South Wales. It is our consistent, if not yet, S is blue and New South Wales is red, okay? So for every value, again, of X, there is some allowed one. So, so why is this true? Because we have one value here for S and X. So I'm only checking the one value. I have to go through all the values of X. I'm going to call X here the domain. Then there is some value of Y, which is consistent. I just need one. And we have that for New South Wales being red. Okay. Does this make sense to everybody? Again, very simple, but. Mm -hmm. Oh, very interesting question. So is it art consistent because New South Wales has a red or blue? It's, it's, it's art consistent from SA to New South Wales because there is a possible assignment that doesn't conflict. So that would mean it's because New South Wales has red. We're checking it only in one direction. Right, so I'm saying um, another way to think about this is I have some power over X, okay? I have some power over what is in the domain of SA. Okay, and I have to check that for every value there of X, that there is some allowed Y. Basically, that's saying whatever I do that's currently in the domain of X, there's some way that I can assign Y. Okay, this is essentially um, doing forward checking in every, uh, in one direction at a time, and then we'll show how we use this to enforce um, consistency across the entire state. Okay, so this was pretty simple. Let's look at another case. Okay, so again, recall the definition of our consistency. It's very, very important. It is directional. Okay, so x to y is consistent if for every value of x, there is some allowed y. So that means if I'm checking our consistency, I have to go through each value in the nature of the sum allowed y. So if I do the other direction, okay, so now I'm checking our consistency for New South Wales to South Australia. Notice the arrow has changed direction, okay? I have two values in my domain. Okay, I can be red or blue. Let's check red first. Okay, if New South Wales is red, that's fine. South Australia can be blue. Right, I'm, I'm safe. But I have to, again, go through every value in New South Wales. If New South Wales is blue, there is no allowed Y in South Australia. So I can draw an arc by removing blue from New South Wales. I know this seems counterintuitive. The first time I saw it, I was very confused. Let's walk through it one more time. I am checking the definition of our consistency if for every value in X, there is some allowed Y. I go through every value. I have red and blue. If 
New South Wales is red. There is an assigned value of blue in South Australia. However, if New South Wales is blue, there is no value that I can choose in South Australia. Okay? But I can make this arc consistent by removing blue. Okay? How's everybody feeling? Okay. So, so? Just a couple things to take away. Our consistency is directional. You go through every value in X and you make sure there is some assigned Y. For those of you who are in math, there are lots of mathematical properties about it. There's reasons it's written this way. I can talk a little bit after class. But check every value of the domain X that there is some allowed Y. So, Again, the arc can be made consistent by removing okay, blue from New South Wales. But once we do that, okay, once we remove something, then if we are removing something from the arc of New South Wales to South Australia, then we need to recheck all its neighbors. Okay, so now once you've removed something, you have to make sure that you haven't caused any inconsistencies elsewhere. This is the exact aspect of the propagation. We've made a difference. Now we need to propagate it through the rest of the paper. Okay, so what we do now is now we draw an arc from, right, from V to New South Wales. And to be able to do that, because it is a neighbor, we go through each value, okay? And what we find is that this will be consistent as long as we remove red from V. Why is this the case? Because if we draw it from V to New South Wales, if V is blue, that's fine. We have an allowed value, red. If V is green, this is not the value of blue. Okay, fine, we did it. Um, sorry, pointer one out. Okay, we will use the mouse. If V is green, then again, we can also be red. However, since we've already deleted blue from New South Wales, if V is red, then there is no allowed value in New South Wales, so we have to remove it. Okay. Any questions on this? So, questions? Exactly. So you're going to check all the neighbors. So this is one example, but you will continue by checking all the neighbors um, and drawing those arcs. We've gone through one instance here, and now I'm going to use this to motivate the whole algorithm. I know that this might sound like a little bit of overkill, but again, consider the case that usually we're not looking at things like arc um, or um, mass scoring. We're looking at things like standards and facts. Right? We have a lot of different variables, a lot of different constraints, and this actually ends up being really powerful. Um, so what are some of the takeaways here? Is that actually our consistency can detect failures earlier than forward checking alone. It can be run as either a preprocessor or after each assignment. And essentially what you're going to do is you're going to repeat it until inconsistent until no inconsistency remains. Why is that really powerful? Because that means we don't have to do all this sort of back checking. Um, we're basically always preempting a failure. So it becomes a really, really powerful algorithm. Okay. So again, if we're checking the sort of neighbors that we had before, now um, we would need to remove SA here um, for these different cases. So let's use this to sort of motivate the actual algorithm. Okay. So there's a lot here. We're going to go through it very, very slowly, okay? And you will be doing this for specific steps on your worksheet, okay? So um, this is a very nice algorithm. It's basically doubly recursive, so yay. So you are going to have, so it's called our consistency. It's called our consistency three. There are many different types. Um, and this is going to return the constraint satisfaction problem, possibly with reduced domains. 
Okay, so essentially what it's doing is it's always going to return a constraint satisfaction problem and it's going to try and reduce those domains to lead us to the best assignment. So the input here is a binary constraint satisfaction problem that has so many variables and local values, variables, which is a queue of arcs. Um, and the arcs are initially the arcs in the con constraint satisfaction problem. Okay, so we are going to go through this line by line. So this is the sort of main part of the algorithm. So again, this local variable here, this Q, we're going to start by initializing that to the Q of arcs in the constraint satisfaction problem. We are going to iterate through the Q. We are going to remove the first element. If we have removed an inconsistent value, so if we have removed something, then we add all the neighbors. Right, exactly what we talked about before. Okay, so if we have removed an inconsistent value, we'll go through that part in a second. Then for each element in the neighbors, we will add that arc to the queue. Okay, what does remove inconsistent values do? Well, it returns true if we remove a value. Okay. How does that work? Well, initially we set remove to be uh, equal to false. We are going to, again, go through each element in the domain and see if there is a possible value for Y. If there's no value in the domain that satisfies the constraints, then we delete it and we say, yes, we did re remove an inconsistent value. Otherwise, we go through the whole thing and we say, oh, it's fine, we didn't remove anything. Okay, so again, the main difference between our consistency and our consistency algorithm here is just the process here in the middle where we are iterating through the queue of arcs and we are removing inconsistent values and add their neighbors if we have removed a value. I know this may sound like this is very inefficient, but actually in practice, it works really well. Okay, any questions about this? Remove first. That's just that's just basically a pop off the queue. Yeah. Great. So we've talked about. Oh yes. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So that will be the. Um, that will be uh, basically determined by the, um, that will be basically every connection that you have in your yeah. Awesome. Cool. So um, we've seen our consistency, but there are many other notions of consistency. So this will be um, maybe interesting to people that are more um, interested in sort of graph theory and algorithms. So, um, you know, our consistency is great, but this doesn't solve all the problems in the world. Um, so our consistency does not detect all inconsistencies. And in fact, we can think about the simplest possible example. What if we have, you know, a very simple sort of graph here. We have X, Y, and Z, and we have uh, the constraints that X cannot be equal to Y, Y cannot be equal to Z, and X cannot be equal to Z. Okay. Again, very simple problem, but just for illustrative purposes. And let's say that the values that X and Y can take are one and two. Okay. So this will be arc consistency, but it is not three consistent, right? Every arc here is consistent. We can create a consistent assignment one and two here. Again, one and two here, one and two here, but it is not three consistent. And there are stronger forms of propagation that can be defined using the notion of what is called K consistency. And for people that are interested, this is a big problem in graph theory. So a constraint satisfaction is arbitrarily K consistent. Now, uh, before I sort of get into K consistency and some other properties, let me say, for this class, all you need to know how to do is our consistency. Okay? We're not three consistency, four consistency. 
we're sort of throwing out the window. So um, this is a little bit more of an advanced topic. So a CSP is taken consistent if for any set of k minus one variables and for any consistent assignments of those variables, there is a consistent value. I can always be assigned to this case that variable. Okay, here are some examples. So there's one consistency or node consistency. We don't really care about that. There's two consistency or what we've just seen, which is called our consistency. And then there's three consistency, which is also called past consistency. But you can keep going and going and going, and there are entire areas of mathematics attached to this. Okay, so again, if we look at the sort of toy, uh, toy example here, uh, it is not three consistent, right? We do not have an assignment for all three here. So again, a little more things about K consistency and then we'll get um, back to the sort of regularly cyclical program. So a graph is strongly K consistent if it is K consistent and it's also K minus one consistent, K minus two consistent, all the way down to one consistent, okay? So, n consistency is really ideal here because we can find a solution without using backtracking, right? We basically have an algorithm to do that. Um, so, what we can show is that if it's n consistent, then you can find the solution and you don't have to worry about other things. You choose any ass assignment to any variable, you choose a new variable, then by two consistency, we know that there's a choice of consistent within the first. Choose another new variable, um, and by three consistency, then there's a value choice that's consistent with the first two. You keep going and going and going and going. Okay. Now this all sounds great, right? But there's no free lunch. Any algorithm for establishing and consistency must take time that's exponential and n in the Right. So there are these nice properties, but we're not really getting there. So uh, further improvements that we can make for constraint satisfaction problems. So um, we are not going to necessarily get to this, but we're gonna um, we're gonna talk about some interesting problems in the last part of the talk. So other further improvements that we can make, we can check for what are called special constraints. So there are special um, special constraints that have special properties, like all diff. That means that we're all different. Basically, all the values are different. So we can check the all this constraint. For example, checking if we also is free and uh, North South Wales is there. We can also check things like the at most constraint. So that balance propagation for larger value domains. There's also um, in an, a whole other area of intelligent backtracking, which basically um, maintains more data structures about when things fail. Um, so Basically, it's attempting to find things that were conflicts that make things failed. Um, and if you really like graph theory and other things, then you have strongly k-consistent, and that's related to other nice properties. Um, so again, there are entire you know other fields, and we're just sort of crossing the surface on this. But again, the big idea of sort of k-consistency with forward checking has uh, really powerful um, ideas here. Any questions here? Okay, um, let's, I'm gonna move on to local search. Um, let's take, um, I know because class is long, let's take like a two minute break if people wanna go to the bathroom, get some water, and then I'm gonna start with a slightly different topic. So um, I will write that on the Zoom too. Okay, can everyone on Zoom hear me? Okay, hopefully this, um, sorry about that. Um, let's see, okay. Um, so everyone can hear me on Zoom, everyone can hear me in the class, I should turn the mic back on. Okay, we're back. Cool. Um, I think it's important to give breaks, especially for um, for these longer classes. So, um, 
we are going to continue by talking about a really interesting area. So we're going to think of now a little bit of a different way of thinking about CSPs. So a different way of solving a constraint satisfaction problem. So we're going to talk about when it's a good algorithm to use versus when it's a bad algorithm to use. Um, and we're going to basically talk about a completely different algorithm for constraint satisfaction problems. And I think it's actually really, really interesting. Um, and in this case, we're going to always have complete assignments and basically use operators to flip different values. So um, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to allow for these unsatisfied constraints. Okay, so we're basically gonna start and we're gonna say, you know what, let's do, let's do something randomly and then use different operators to do the reassignment, okay? Uh, for variable selection, remember we were thinking about different types of heuristics or best cases to do that. Now we're gonna randomly select any conflicted variable, okay? And for value selection, we will use the min conflicts heuristic. So basically we will continue to use uh, the value heuristic, min, minimum conflicts heuristic, but the variable selection is now done randomly. So we're gonna now select a new value that results in a minimum number of conflicts with other variables. Okay. Let's see that through an example. So again, this is something a little bit different than what we saw before. So we are talking now about this idea of local search. So we're gonna sort of relax the constraints and then fix it, okay? And I apologize, I know people have seen this before. We're going back to end queens. So um, basically what we're going to do here is we're gonna start with our chessboard, right? And then what we're going to do is basically, we're just gonna put things on the board, okay? So again, we're just gonna put N queens on the board and now we're gonna basically fix it, okay? So, we will now try to choose the assignment with the minimum number of conflicts, okay? So we will choose this one here, okay? So hopefully everyone can see that here in blue, right? And now we've chose this random variable and now we're going to use, again, the minimum, uh, we're gonna use the value heuristic to figure out where to move it, okay? So, Again, we wanna use the minimum number of conflicts to move it. So here I've listed the number of conflicts that we have, okay? So we have one conflict on the top row um, and then we have uh, two conflicts in the second row, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So again, what is the idea? I'm basically using this for the conflict. So if I put it here, then there's one conflict here. If I put it here, there is one conflict here, and then I think it's also on a diagonal, is that right? Uh, oh, and that's on the diagonal there. Sorry, I'm like seeing it at like a 45 degree angle. So you can sort of verify those there. So again, if we're using uh, minimum um, conflicts, then we will move it to the one with the least amount of conflicts, which is this one here. So this is now our resulting board, okay? Does everyone see what I did here? Hopefully pretty simple. Okay, so now I'm going to choose, we do not have a proper assignment, right? We still have conflicts. And so now I am going to choose another variable. So I'm gonna choose this one here, okay? And again, you can basically count out the number of conflicts here. So there are two conflicts, the row below, but there's one with zero, that's great. So that is where we are going to want to move it. And that's exactly what we do, okay? So this is really easy to code up. So you pick an initial completed assignment at random, okay? You just say, I'm just gonna put stuff on the board and let's see what happens. Then we will repeat. So we will pick a conflicted variable at random, whichever one it's conflicted. Then we are going to set the new value of that variable to the one that minimizes the number of conflicts. If the new assignment is not conflicting, then we return it, okay? And again, this is using the minimum conflicts heuristic. 
pretty simple, right? Does this all make sense to people? Oh, I see a bunch of questions. Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. So in a lot of these, um, so I'm sort of delving into a slightly different field. So a little bit of background. So this is actually from randomized algorithms. <clears throat> and largely in randomized algorithms, if you have a tie, you'll usually, you'll usually move it to a new place. Um, in most cases, <laughs> there are other bounds on that. But yes, you're absolutely right. You could have just, you could have just kept it there. It would have been just fine. Um, I saw there was another question. Yes. Sorry, can you say that again? And then I'll... Yeah, so that's a good question. Oh, I just tripped over the mic. Great, one second. That was very strange. Okay. Um, yeah, so the question was, what if we had in the first column here, um, or any of them really, that everything was two, that they were all the same value? Again, that's delving into a little bit of a complicated subject of randomized algorithms. Largely, you would either choose it randomly or there are some, uh, there's some randomized algorithm problems where you want to move it the farthest and that it depends on the type of problem. But in general, you would choose it randomly. The current state is the past, but the two copies. So the question is, is there um, any situations you would get to where the current state is the best, but you move it anyway? Um, so there are bounds on that. Again, randomized algorithms problem. If you guys are interested in this, um, I'm happy to talk about it offline. Um, there are cases where that could happen, where you're actually in optimal, but you end up moving it. But again, by, by different types of bounds, you will eventually get back there anyway. Um, and on average, that doesn't happen as much. And the reason we have this is because it's, we're assuming if these things are perfectly random, that if we take enough random choices, we'll get there. Um, happy to talk about that more after class up. Um, that was a laundry list of different proofs. Okay, cool. So again, this is pretty cool. Um, and the really nice thing about this is that it's really easy to code and it's really easy to see. So let's talk about what that looks like. Um, so, Local search for constraint satisfaction. Okay, we are going to write a function called uh, minimum conflicts or min conflicts that takes in a constraint satisfaction problem and a max number of steps. We're going to get to why we would want max number of steps, and it returns either a solution or a failure. Okay, so the CSP we already know it's a constraint satisfaction problem, and max steps is the number of steps that are allowed before giving up. Okay. We will set a variable here, current, equal to an initial complete assignment for the constraint satisfaction problem. Okay. Then you will do this for one through max steps. Okay. This is why we use max steps here, because again, there are bounds on this for randomized algorithms that will say eventually it will converge. But again, if you don't want this to run forever, you should have some exit condition. <laughs> That's why we use max steps. So we continue in this loop for a maximum number of steps. If current, so if our initial complete assignment or wherever we are is a solution, then we're gonna return it. Great. Otherwise, we randomly choose a variable that's conflicted and we set the value here to be the value for var that minimizes conflicts, okay? And we set that variable to value in current and we repeat through this, okay? Now, again, we can continue through this forever, right? We could get really, really unlucky. So that's why we use max steps. And in that case, we return a failure, but actually that doesn't happen very often, okay? Um, so one question here, what, what idea is this where, um, Maybe we can't find a solution and we return failure. Does anybody remember that from module one? So it's incomplete, right? Because we might, we might return failure and not an assignment. Um, so although that there is a possibility for it, actually, because this is a randomized algorithm and we know special things about these types of randomized algorithms, 
it actually does pretty well. So local search with the min conflicts heuristic actually works really well for the million queens problem. Here's the reason. If the solutions are densely distributed in the exponential space and to the n, right? Which means that on average, a solution is just a few steps away from a randomly picked assignment. And there are these really nice bounds that we see. Yes. So if you return a failure, then that means you did not find a solution. And in fact, you can't, there are many CSPs that you just can never solve, right? If I over constrain my problem, then I won't, I won't return a solution, right? And when we have this in large state spaces with large numbers of constraints, then there may not be a, their solution may not exist and we may not even be able to compute it, right? Remember the sort of MP completeness, especially for things like, for things like map coloring. Again, the nice thing about using something like local search is you can set a max number of steps, right? And actually, if you run a randomized algorithm a certain amount of times, it uh, eventually converges to a possible solution. And they have a lot of these approximate algorithms for things like three sat, they have this for things like map coloring as well. That's an entirely different subject, but yes, this can, to answer your question, there are cases where it will not return an assignment. Sometimes it's because the algorithm doesn't find it. A lot of times it's because the solution does not exist. Great, any other problems on this? Any other questions, concerns? So let's sort of finish up this idea by talking a little bit about problem structure, right? So how can problem structure help us find a solution so quickly? And this is actually going back to a previous point in the problem, right? We pointed out the idea that this sort of graph was really nice for map coloring because you have Tasmania, right? You have things that are basically disconnected. And what's really important in this class and in other computer science classes that you'll take is this idea of subproblem identification, right? Coloring Tasmania and the mainland. So what do I mean by that? Coloring this part of the map here, right? That's connected and Tasmania, these are separate. They don't rely on each other. In the real world, right? There is a sea. <laughs> between the mainland and Tasmania, okay? And it's really important to identify these sorts of connected components of the constrained graph. Once you can figure out that things are independent subproblems or they don't rely on each other, we can really, really improve performance, okay? So again, for those of you that are interested in math, for those of you that are interested in graph theory, this becomes a really important subject, but we also see this in a lot of computer science problems, especially a lot of AI problems, okay? I'm going to sort of show that with um, some simplified computation. So a lot of people will call these sort of back of the envelope calculations. Um, that means that they're not exactly precise, but this is for you to get sort of an idea of what I'm talking about. So let's revisit this problem. So suppose that each problem has C variables out of a total of N. So let's say that we've identified um, each problem on average has C variables out of a total of N in our graph, okay? The worst case cost, right, is big O of N over C, right? Because we split it up into sub problems of psi C um, times D to the C. Okay. which is basically, you know, linear in N. Instead of having this for big O of D to the N, which is exponential. So remember here, D is basically the average degree. Okay, let's just give an example of what that actually looks like if we are to use this with real numbers. Okay. So let's say that we have N, N is 80. We have C. So we have basically around C variables for each subproblem, that's 20, and then D is two, okay? So we have a pretty small degree between those. Then, right, basically, 
if we were to do this naively, we would have two to the 80, which is uh, 4 billion years at 1 million nodes per second. Right. But if we actually split this into subproblems, then we get four seconds at 1 million nodes per second. That's huge speed up, right? So um, a lot of times thinking about this type of problem structure can really, really help, okay? So there's a whole nother class of things that we can look for. Um, so another good property that we look for in problems, especially in constraint satisfaction problems, are these idea of basically tree structured constraint satisfaction problem. <clears throat> so what do I mean by a tree? I basically mean that it doesn't have any loops. And in particular, there's a theorem that says if the constraint graph, so again, if I'm drawing um, edges between nodes that have a constraint, so if that constraint graph has no loops, then the constraint satisfaction problem can be solved in big O and D squared time, okay? And again, compare that with the difference of solving this with a general constraint satisfaction problem, where our worst case, again, would be exponential. So this is big O of D to the N, okay? So let's talk a little bit about what that looks like. So. Again, any tree structured constraint satisfaction problem can be solved in time linear in the number of variables. How does this work? Well, ooh, I just went back. Um, you choose a variable as your root. You order the variables from root to leaves such that every node's parent, okay, precedes it in the ordering. And you label this variable one, x1 to xn, okay? It's sort of um, shown here. And then for your J from N down to two, you're going to apply the removing consistent values that we saw before for the parent to the child. And then for J one to N, we will assign X of J consistently with our parent here, okay? So essentially what you're doing here is you're basically ordering things according to some sort of topological ordering over this graph. You're basically assigning and then propagating. I'm, again, I'm just showing you guys this to make you aware of this and in case the signals are fancy. Um, but again, for this class, you're only, um, you're only responsible for forward checking and our consistency. Okay, these are just a little bit of um, advanced topics because we do have a little bit of time. Any questions on this? So a couple other things. So another type of structure that you might want to use are basically what are called nearly structured, uh, nearly tree structured constraint satisfaction problems. So again, trees have really nice properties. One of the reasons that I'm mentioning this is that you guys will see this in sort of Bayesian networks as well. So these ideas do come back to the class. So here we're thinking about, you know, can we create more general constraint graphs that can be reduced to trees, okay? So essentially what this is, is basically creating what's called, you know, um, like super nodes. So one thing that you can think about is basically removing things from the tree. So removing certain nodes. For example, can you make, can you basically sort of eliminate SA from the problem, just take it away, and all of a sudden you have this really nice structure, which makes it very easy to color. Now, putting SA back in becomes a little bit of a problem, but that's neither here nor there. This is also is the idea of sort of collapsing certain nodes. So in general, what you want to do is you want to get your constraint graph in as simple a form as possible. And if we can make them tree-like, that's really great. So you either remove the node, you add the value to it, and then basically you do the rest. So in the SA example, what you would do is you basically say, SA is going to be red. We take red out of all the rest of the uh, domain for all its neighbors, and then we solve the rest like a tree. Again, for these simple examples, it's not very important, but imagine if we're talking about things in the order of millions, right? It can have huge ramifications. Um, the other thing we can do is basically create these types of cluster, cluster trees, so we can sort of cluster nodes together into a super node. Um, again, 
that's very important for doing these types of tree structured algorithms. So where are you guys going to see constraint satisfaction problems? So you've probably seen these in all walks of life. You see it in Sudoku, you see it in Myrtle, you see it in assignment problems, basically who is teaching what class. Um, you've probably seen a lot of um, faculty sort of switch classes last minute. So um, this is a very overly constrained assignment problem. Things like time timetable scheduling. So which class is offered and where is it offered and how does it, um, if we have constraints that we want to have a certain number of students in the class. <clears throat> Other things that this is used for, so I know there's a very vast um, array of people in this class. It's also used for hardware con configuration. So a lot of um, people use these for figuring out different types of hardware constraints. It's used for transportation scheduling, factory scheduling, floor planning, fault diagnosis, and many, many more. Um, one of the big caveats that I want to say, again, in the constraint satisfaction problems so far that we've seen in this class, we've only seen things that are basically integer values. Many, many real world problems have real uh, value variables. They could be defined over time intervals. They could not be as straightforward as the ones that we saw in this class. Okay. Um, just, you know, a little bit more of the sort of history of constraint programming. So Eugene Freuder um, wrote this in uh, the magazine Constraints. So constraint programming represents one of the closest approaches computer science has yet made to the holy grail of programming. Uh, the user states the problem and the computer solves it. Why do I want to bring this up? Um, especially now in the age of chat GPT uh, and all of these, you know, what are people are describing as sort of, dare I say, sentient technologies, which they're not. We can talk about that <laughs> offline. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you have to state the problem to the computer. The computer is not thinking on its own, right? It's solving an optimization problem. And a lot of times, those problems are constraint satisfaction problems. And a lot of times the solutions that you see are actually things like checking our consistency and doing path consistency and different types of things. So this is actually a very powerful tool that you see in many areas of computer science. As I said, you can see it in hardware configuration, even in fault diagnosis for things for cars. So it's a very, very popular um, part of computer science. So when are you going to use a constraint satisfaction problem technique? So this is very important for a couple of different things. So very famously on the final for this class in CSE 140, you will have a lot of open-ended problems. We will ask you, hey, here's an open-ended problem. What type of technique would you use? And one of the types of problems that we may say is a possible solution is constraint satisfaction problem. So when would you use it? When? the problem can be expressed as a set of variables with constraints on their values, right? If it's something like an assignment problem, if you have a specific set of constraints, okay? When will you use the sort of um, techniques that we talked about in this class? Well, when the constraints are relatively simple, i.e. binary. Again, there's an entire fields dedicated to what happens when you have intervals, what happens when you have real value constraints, et cetera. Um, other um, ideas, when the constraints propagate well, right? When we look at our consistency, it's able to eliminate many values. And that's why um, we use it for a lot of cases. Um, so that's when we would want to use something like our consistency, when the constraints really propagate well, when we have these things that are really strongly connected. When will we want to use local search? Well, when the solutions are densely distributed in the space of possible assignments. Sometimes that's a hard thing to come up with, right? Um, but there are some approximations that you can do to basically see when your solutions are basically close together. <clears throat> okay. So um, let me give a summary. And then um, I basically only wanted to make it through this module. So I'm also happy to stay, um, happy to stay for questions. Um, otherwise, happy to chat with you guys after. So. Summary of what we talked about. So this basically brought us through all that you need to know for module two, okay? So CSPs, they're a very special kind of problem. The states are defined by values of a fixed set of variables and uh, the goals are tested by constraints on those variable values, okay? So backtracking using depth first search uh, is with one variable assigned per node. The variable ordering and the value selection heuristics help significantly. 
we saw that, right? And we saw what happens when you don't have those. So do make sure that you know what the, those heuristics stand for and know when to use them. Uh, forward checking prevents assignments that will lead to failure and constraint propagation does the additional work to constrain the values and detect their inconsistencies. The CSP representation allows analysis of the different problem structure. Tree structured CSPs can be solved in linear time and local search using min conflicts is often very effective in practice and in fact a lot of people use them. So I kind of sped through that material. I know we have a lot of time uh, left in class, but I thought I would just finish this module. I know you guys have a programming assignment due. So um, why don't I stop the lecture there? And if people have questions, I'm happy to stay after. Hello?